Coming up with a great movie villain is no easy feat, but when the right actor is paired with a great script, filmmakers can create statuesque antagonists that will be remembered forevermore. And so, the temptation to just bring a hit villain back to raise hell all over again in the sequel kinda speaks for itself, because why not just give the audience more of what they enjoyed the first time, right? But sometimes, in an attempt to shake things up, they end up nudged into a more heroic role instead. I'm Ewan, this is War Culture, and here are 10 movie villains who became heroes in the sequel. Number 10. Hector Barbosa, Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End The original Pirates of the Caribbean introduced the deliciously villainous Captain Barbosa, played to perfection by the great Jeffrey Rush. A conniving schemer determined to break the curse placed upon him and his men, he becomes a major thorn in the side of Jack Sparrow and company, even if he's ultimately defeated come the ending. Sequel Dead Man's Chest introduced a worthy antagonist successor in Bill Nighy's Davy Jones, but the film concluded with one hell of a big twist, the return of Barbosa from the first movie. More to the point, Barbosa is reintroduced as a quasi-heroic figure to help guide the assembled party to save Jack's soul from Davy Jones' locker. Arr. And so, in the third film, At World's End, Barbosa indeed adopts a more heroic adjacent tenor, even if by film's end, he's scarpered with the Black Pearl in search of the Fountain of Youth. Barbosa's allegiances certainly prove fluid, shall we say, throughout the rest of the franchise, though on the balance of his actions, teaming up with Jack to take down several mutual enemies, he's absolutely closer to hero than he is a villain. Number 9. Jaws – Moonraker Roger Moore's third James Bond film, The Spy Who Loved Me, aka his best one, introduced audiences to the instantly iconic henchman Jaws, played by Richard Keel fondly remembered for his hulking frame and sharp, steely teeth. Though Jaws' boss, Carl Stromberg, played by Kurt Jurgens, is killed at the film's end, Jaws lives on to fight another day and return in the next film, Moonraker. Here, Jaws is aligned with the evil industrialist Hugo Drax, played by Michael Lonsdale, though undergoes a change of heart later in the film. The seeds are sown when Jaws, who is presented as far more of a comic relief character this time around, falls in love with a petite bespectacled woman by the name of Dolly, played by Blanche Revelec. And so, after learning that neither he nor Dolly will be spared from Drax's plot to exterminate most of the human race, he's persuaded to help Bond take him out. The last time we see Jaws, he's made it back to Earth safely with Dolly. And while the pair were originally going to marry in For Your Eyes Only, this subplot was ultimately cut, along with Jaws' entire role, in an attempt to rein in some of the silliness of the Moore era. According to director Lewis Gilbert, the decision to change Jaws from a villain into a hero was motivated by scores of fan mail from young children asking why Jaws had to be a baddie. Oh, it's really cute. Imagine being a kid and like, Jaws is your favourite Bond character. If that was you, let us know down in the comments below. The whole Jaws face turn thing is goofy as all hell, but in a movie as fundamentally ridiculous as Moonraker, it doesn't really feel out of place. Number 8. Teddy Sanders – Bad Neighbours 2 The quote-unquote villainy of comedy Bad Neighbours may ultimately be relatively low stakes compared to most movies on this list, but it still counts all the same. Couple Mac and Kelly, played by Seth Rogen and Rose Byrne respectively, are adjusting to life with their infant daughter when a hard party in fraternity, Delta Psi Beta, moves in next door. The frat's hell-raising antics are spearheaded by its president, Teddy Sanders, played by Zac Efron, who isn't much interested in toning down the mayhem for Mac and Kelly's benefit, resulting in a war of escalation between the two sides. The matter is resolved somewhat amicably by the ending, but when Bad Neighbors 2 introduces the considerably more vicious sorority Kappa Nu as Mac and Kelly's new neighbors, Teddy is pulled back into the fold to help take the sorority down. Though Teddy initially sides with Kappa Nu and their leader Shelby, played by Chloe Grace Moretz, he eventually appreciates that they're far more chaotic than he ever was, and so becomes a force of good to help his former enemies out. Number 7. Apollo Creed – Rocky 3 
While it would obviously be a huge stretch to say that Rocky Balboa's opponent in the first two Rocky movies is an out and out villain, Apollo Creed is in the very least an antagonist who stands in the way of Rocky's quest for victory. Also, gotta just take a moment to appreciate Carl Weathers here. This guy is sorely missed already. Sly Stallone's Rocky of course defeats Apollo at the end of Rocky 2, and when the third film rolls around, Apollo returns to help train Rocky to take on a powerful new contender in Clubber Lang, played by Mr. T. One of the most 80s performances you're ever likely to come across. Despite their initial frostiness, Rocky and Apollo develop a bond throughout their training sessions, enough that they become genuine close friends. A friendship which would have likely lasted a lifetime had Apollo not been killed by Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. This is a movie death I'm never getting over. All the same, Apollo's legacy casts a long heroic shadow over the franchise, which of course pivoted to follow his son Adonis, played by Michael B. Jordan, in the recent Creed trilogy. Number 6. Mini-Me – Austin Powers in Goldmember Vern Troyer's Mini-Me is one of the most iconic characters in the Austin Powers franchise, introduced in the second film, The Spy Who Shagged Me, as a dwarf clone of the villainous Dr. Evil, of course played by Mike Myers. Throughout the film, Dr. Evil's son Scott, Seth Green, grows jealous of the paternal bond his father develops with his clone. In sequel Goldmember, however, Mini-Me decides to defect from the bad side after Dr. Evil rejects him in favor of Scott who has begun to embrace his own evil instincts. Mini-Me doesn't just team up with Austin and company though, he even flat out dons his own mini Austin uniform for good measure, and it's a great look it must be said. But that's not all either. In the ending, Dr. Evil himself also decides to switch sides after learning that Austin is his brother, with the former nemesis teaming up to stop gold members, again like Myers, nefarious plot to destroy the world. Number 5. Leatherface – Texas Chainsaw 3D Aside from being quite needlessly released in 3D, 2013's direct sequel to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre made one especially bold change to the series' formula, turning chainsaw-wielding murderer Leatherface, played here by Dan Yeager, into something of an anti-hero. Though much of the movie sees Leatherface ripping through anyone with a pulse, as per usual, in the second half of the story, he turns his chainsaw towards the corrupt authorities who were responsible for his family being murdered decades prior. Moreover, I'm sorry to bring this up again, horror fans, because you all all know this by now, Leatherface teams up with protagonist Heather, played by Alexandra Daddario, after it's revealed that they're cousins, allowing him to exact brutal, justified revenge against the cops and save Heather's life in the process. And yeah, the strange alteration to Leatherface's allegiance didn't exactly go down well with Texas Chainsaw diehards, who still hear the phrase, do your thing, cuz, in their nightmares. But such is what happens when a franchise gets so blatantly long in the tooth, the producers will throw any random idea at the wall to see if it sticks. Unsurprisingly, neither of the Texas Chainsaw movies released since have tried to pull off the same gambit again. Number 4. Zed McGlunk – Police Academy 3 – Back in Training Even if you haven't seen the Police Academy movies in many years or just haven't seen them at all, you can probably still hear the unmistakably off-kilter vocal stylings of criminal-turned-cop Zed McGlunk, played by Bobcat Goldthwait. Zed first appeared in Police Academy 2, their first assignment, as the primary antagonist, the unhinged leader of the violent gang known as the Scullions. Zed is arrested in the ending, but because Bobcat Goldthwait's performance in the role was just so damn loved, he returned for Police Academy 3 back in training with a reformed Zed now trying out for the Police Academy. Granted, villains can make an implausible turn for the heroic far more easily in a silly comedy that isn't tethered quite so firmly to reality, but it was nevertheless a sort of neat way to keep Goldthwait in the franchise without simply having him do the same old Zed shtick again. Better yet, for those who like these movies, we even got a love interest in Police Academy 4, Citizens on Patrol, because why the hell not? Number 3. Gunnar Jensen – The Expendables 2 Of all his action cohorts from the 80s and 90s, I think Dolph Lundgren can probably lay the biggest claim to being the most underutilized of the bunch. 
I mean, seriously, th this guy's screen presence, it's genuinely magnetic. You'll get that from watching Rocky IV and Showdown in Little Tokyo, as well as a lot of the director video work he's done in the years since, but for the most part, I don't think anyone really knew what this guy had cooking. It should have been massive. I mean, he already is physically massive, but you get my meaning. One of the films that kind of exemplifies this trend is the first Expendables movie. While okay enough as a first attempt at an action legend Avengers, it definitely didn't make the most of Dolph, who plays a struggling mercenary battling drug addiction called Gunner. Gunner sells out his fellow Expendables after he's booted off the team for extreme violence, working with the big bad of the picture, James Monroe, played by Eric Roberts. Gunner comes close to killing Sylvester Stallone's Barney Ross and Jet Li's Yang, but is shot, redeeming himself by giving away the whereabouts of Monroe's base of operations after dealing with his wounds. Thankfully, the Expendables 2 had the common sense to give Dolph a more heroic turn placing a greater spotlight on a fully back in action gunner as he joins Barney and the gang to take down an evil Jean-Claude Van Damme, appropriately named Villaine in the script, which is just some serious George Lucasing in the naming department there. This incarnation of Gunner drew upon Lundgren's real life background, including his degrees in chemical engineering, and overall, he just gets way more time in the spotlight than in the previous movie, and is way better served by being an actual hero. Number two, the T-800, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. James Cameron's The Terminator introduced one of the most tenaciously terrifying villains in cinema history with the seemingly unstoppable cyborg juggernaut that was Arnold Schwarzenegger's T-800. But for the sequel, Cameron came up with a novel twist. What if he brought the T-800 back? Not as a killing machine intent on murdering mother to the resistance, Sarah Connor, Linda Hamilton, but rather tasked with protecting her son, John, from another killer cyborg sent back through time. Now, this is admittedly a mild cheat in the sense that this isn't the very same T-800 which pursued Sarah in the original movie, it having been crushed in a hydraulic press and all, but for all intents and purposes, T2 does nevertheless bring the original villain back and switch their allegiance. The Terminator sent from the future to protect John is another T-800 machine captured by the human resistance and reprogrammed to protect him. This proved quite the shock to those lucky enough to catch T2 in cinemas without knowing the twist beforehand, and today it remains arguably the greatest instance of a character swapping sides in a follow-up. And number one, Jin Zhanzhou. Ip Man 2. In the biographical martial arts film Ip Man, we meet the highly skilled fighter Jin Zhanzhou, played by Fan Su Wong, who, while facing tough times, has become the leader of a fierce bandit gang. He is eventually defeated by the heroic Ip Man, played by Donnie Yen, in a fight, who then runs him out of the city of Foshan for good measure. That seemed to be all she wrote for the character, but Jin makes a surprise reappearance in Ip Man 2 when Ip and his student Wong, played by Huang Xiaoming, are overwhelmed by a rabble of rival martial arts students. Jin shows up with his gang and helps rescue Ip and Wong, redeeming himself in the process. Fun fact though, Jin was originally shot dead by a Japanese colonel in the first Ip Man movie, but the filmmakers ultimately decided to cut his demise, leaving the door open for him to make his triumphant return in the sequel. 